All right, everybody, it's June 11th, and we are going to go with Headlines with Octicus. We're starting with Bill Maher and his horrible offensive language. Bill Maher is Ann Coulter with shorter hair. They both say outrageous and even hateful things to get press in a desperate effort to remain relevant. Wow! Projecting much. Uh, Meyer gave us yet another example when he dropped the N-word on his HBO real-time Friday night. Oh my god, it's so horrible. It's so horrible. Here's the joke. He's talking to um, U.S. Senator Ben Sass from Nebraska, and Sass said this. You're welcome. We'd love to have you work in the fields with us. Mar, work in the fields. Senator, I'm a house nigger. That, that's it. That was the whole joke. That was literally the entire joke. That's all it is. He targeted himself, and they're acting like he walked up to a black person and said that. Fucking idiots. This was truly white privilege on parade. Oh, God. You have Marr and a white Republican senator yucking it up over a racial epithet and the plight of slaves. And just so it's clear, despite not working in the fields, house slaves were still slaves that were not often abused, raped, or killed by slave masters. Yes, we know our fucking history. We get it. Fucking... Relax, dear God. But of course, um, the author of this article is... They, they've got to go for the the full, full-blown virtue signal. So, so here's this bit. In the 15 years that Mars hosted his HBO show, he has made countless indefensible comments, many not even framed as jokes. In the past, I've called out his despicable anti-Muslim bigotry, meaning he questions political Islam which dates back to 2010 and continues to this day. And Mark's history of misogyny has been well documented by others. Yeah, which is him disagreeing with feminism. That's... that's it. That's pretty well it. You're freaking the fuck out over a guy making a tasteless joke on a show with a history of making tasteless jokes, and you just really need to ram how virtuous you are down our fucking throats. Anyway, let's let's move on to something slightly more entertaining, which is making fun of Pleza on CNN. There's a growing trend among Donald Trump advisors. Listen to what he says, not what he tweets. On the Today Show Monday, Trump counselor Kellyanne Conway bemoaned the obsession with covering everything he says on Twitter and little what he does as president. On New Day, Trump advisor Sebastian Gorka echoed that sentiment, insisting on host Chris Kumo that it's social media, Chris. It's social media. You know the difference, right? Adding, it's not policy, it's not an executive order, it's social media. Please understand the difference. Here's the thing. There is no difference. There is, actually. You're just too dense to realize it. And, in fact, Trump's tweets are actually more important than the more formal statements coming out of his White House because they represent something much closer to what he believes on nearly every issue. Okay, you need to understand that there is a difference between what he politically believes and what he personally believes. It's the concept referred to as the royal we. It's why royalty talked that way. It was the royal we, and then there was them. They were not the same people. And you don't know that. On the one hand, they insist Trump will never stop tweeting because it's his way of communicating directly with his supporters without the media filter. The media would love for or Trump to stop tweeting. Trump advertisers insist. Of course they would, because then they wouldn't have any fucking news. On the other hand, they argue that Trump's tweets shouldn't be taken as serious as official statements from White House or policy proposals offered by the administration. So which is it? Is, tr is Twitter's Trump's last defense against the biased and fake news media? Well, you are fake. You fucking blow everything out of proportion. Or is it the vehicle for a media to cherry-pick comments to make him look less well-versed or calm than his official statements? Of course he's less calm on Twitter. Nobody's fucking calm on Twitter. But that obvious contradiction aside, and you are still left with this fact, the President of the United States is expressing himself directly on the issue of the day via his phone. To not cover that, and to cover it exactly as we would an official statement of the White House, is an abrogation of the media's duty. To sum it up, put my journalistic integrity! Yeah, you have none. You've got fucking none. You're sitting there flapping over his fucking tweets, and no one cares anymore. The president makes no distinction between Twitter, an official statement, or even a formal speech. He uses them interchangeably, and clearly feels as though Twitter allows him to speak most freely and directly. Why should we then treat Twitter as different in any way, shape, or form when it comes to Trump's communications? A Twitter handle started earlier this month, at uh, RealPressSecBot, drives this point home better than I ever could. 
Here's what it does. Scrapes Twitter every five minutes for a new Trump tweet and then transforms it into correct presidential statement format, which produces this, which is this fake presidential statement. Okay, whatever. It just sticks the proper header on it. Pretty striking, right? Now, because you could do that with literally any fucking tweet, dude. You're putting way, way too much shit in that. But also fundamentally accurate, because when a president speaks, whether electronically or out loud, it's by default a presidential statement. No shit. Why to play word games? Of course it's a presidential statement. Just like you, every time you talk, is a dumbass statement. And as his ongoing legal battle with the so-called travel bans begins in stark relief, Trump's tweeted words have already been used against him, legally speaking. Alright, that's... Okay, it's the court, because he actually said it. If it's good enough for the courts, it's good enough for the media. Except when it's not, and then you just pretend it's not there. Throughout the campaign, Trump used his massive social media following as a way to drive news cycles and settle scores. It was, without a question, a massive asset for him that the other candidates, particularly in the Republican primaries, didn't enjoy. That social media presence, as anyone who has a big following on, say, Twitter knows, cuts both ways. Trump is feeling the stinging side of late, almost entirely because he uses Twitter to contradict his aides' attempts to manage his message in a form that is less controversial. The media's job isn't to put forward the most favorable Trump message, or the least favorable Trump message for that matter. Bullshit! I, you fucking never say anything good about him. It's always bad and scandal and scandal and scandal and scandal and scandal, and you have now actually compared what's going on to Watergate. I knew that was going to happen eventually. It, I, actually, I'm surprised it didn't happen faster. The media's job is to give the American people who pay Trump's salary the best look into how their president thinks about the key issues of the day. Again, I state... But majority integrity, you don't have any, please. Uh, you've got none. It's all gone, forever. Don't have any anymore. You got nothing. Okay, moving on out of CNN territory into um more. I don't know if it's depressing or funnier. Not, I'm not quite sure. But uh, if we needed a reason to hate corporations more, I think we might have just found it. And that is Outcry Over EpiPens. You may have heard of this, but if you haven't, here it is. You might recall EpiPens as last year's poster child for out-of-control drug prices. But this simple medical device contains only about a dollar's worth of the drug uh, eupinephrine. Uh, the company that sells it, Myland, earned the public's enmity and lawmakers' scrutiny after ratcheting up prices to $609 a box. I didn't know about that until a couple of days ago. That's fucking insane. Outraged parents, presidential candidates, and even both parties in Congress managed to unite to attack Milan for the price increases. By August, the company, which sells thousands of drugs and says it fills one in every 13 American prescriptions, was making mea culpas and renewing its promise to do what's right, not what's easy, as the company's mission statement goes. So I was surprised when my pharmacist informed me, months after those floggings and apologies had faded from the headlines, that I would still need to pay $609 for a box of two EpiPens. That's... That's fucking nuts. I mean, you, a dollar's worth of a drug, and it's sick. Like, how the fuck can you get away with that? I would assume, you know, 50 bucks? Because that's how shit works, because you got to stick it in the pen and everything, and all that other crap, but still. Not quite. What's more, Milan is back in the news on Wednesday. Regulators said the company had most likely overcharged Medicaid by $1.27 billion for EpiPens. Holy shit! How the fuck are you people still in business if you pull that shit? Like, my God. The same day, a group of pension funds announced that they hoped to unseat much of Milan's board for new lows in corporate stewardship, including paying the chairman $97 million in 2016, more than the salaries of the chief executives at Disney, General Electric, and Walmart combined. Holy fuck, Milan! I mean, I know people make the comparison that America's going the way of Shadowrun, but Jesus Christ, that was not permission. Oh my God. Uh, over the last several weeks, I've spoken with ten former high-ranking executives at Milan who told me that they weren't surprised Debbie Ben prices were still high, nor were many startled by last week's developments. Milan, they said, is an example of a firm that has thrived by learning to absorb and then ignore opium. I probably said that wrong. Basically, they absorb being people being pissed off at them. The company has an effective monopoly on a life-saving product, which has allowed its leaders to see public outrage as a tax they must pay, and then move on. And this is why, children, monopolies suck. They are good for no one. 
unless you're the asshole running it. To understand Mylan's culture, consider a series of conversations that began inside the company in 2014. A group of mid-level executives was concerned about the soaring prices of EpiPens, which had more than doubled in the previous four years. Yeah, that's fucking nuts. Uh, there were rumors that even more aggressive hikes were planned. Former executives who related this and other anecdotes requested anonymity because they had non-disclosure agreements or feared retaliation. Aspects of their accounts were, displayed, uh, were disputed by Mylan. That makes sense. I mean, I usually find the whole anonymity shit to be annoying, but, well, they're doing it for the same reason I'm not showing my face, because I don't want to get in fucking trouble. In meetings, the executives began warning Milan's top leaders that the price increase seemed like unethical profiteering at the expense of sick children, sick children and adults, according to people who were visited in the conversations. Because it is. It, it seems like it because it is. Over the next 16 months, those internal warnings were repeatedly aired. At one gathering, executives shared their concerns with Milan's chairman, Robert Corey. As I like to call him, King Douche Canoe. Mr. Corey replied that he was untroubled. He raised both his middle fingers and explained, using colorful language, that anyone criticizing Milan, including its employees, ought to go copulate with themselves. Critics in Congress and on Wall Street, he said, should do the same. And regulators of the Food and Drug Administration, they too deserved a round of anatomically challenging self-fulfillment. <laughs> I have a feeling he illustrated the diversity of the word fuck in that entire statement. And yeah, King Douche Canoe, right there. Fucking terrible human being. When the executive, uh, executives conveyed their anxieties to other leaders, including the chief executive, Heather Bre uh, Bresh? Bresh? Breach? Fuck it, I don't care. These two were brushed off, they told me. Yeah, it... Mylan is a fucking clusterfuck. And, and apparently, now you can get coupons or something to make it cheaper. But if you're getting a coupon to make it cheaper, that means the assholes can sell it cheaper in the first place. Or, you know, it goes, well, I only paid $100 out of pocket for it. That means your insurance company's paying the other 500 bucks, And those of us who don't use EpiPens, hi me, and pay insurance, are going to wind up eating that for you. So Mylan... Fuck you, you win the douchebag award. Peace out.